How are you? This is rather lovely to be here. I am doing really great. Just n another normal work day for me, minus you guys being here on a Thursday. So it's doing well, doing really well. Well, let's hand the sax over to young Eric over there and let's get stuck in. There you go. <laughs> so we're here with uh, the rather wonderful Eva Reichstadt and uh, this is her home studio and you, I don't know, eclectic is a big taste in your work life. I mean, you've done pretty much everything from assisting all the way through to film mixing, mm -hmm. recording bands, yeah. uh, running live sound, uh, play, I mean, you name it. And you play a bunch of instruments. Tell us where it all started. So I'm from Minnesota. I went to school at Minneapolis Media Institute, um, which was a school that sort of started uh, by, was started by uh, Paul Peterson, who used to play with Prince, and then Tom Tucker as well, who was Prince's engineer for a long time. Because Minneapolis, a lot of the Minneapolis music scene, especially like kind of the bigger cats in Minneapolis, came from Prince's camp or worked with Prince, right? So the school was started by them and I went and toured. It had just opened maybe a year before I started going there or even less. I may have been like, the second or third graduating class. So I went I went there one day to tour it and it was amazing. Uh, the minute I walked in, they like gave me a hug and they're like, welcome. And I was like, wow, okay. So I'm gonna go here uh, <laughs> to school because this place is awesome. Um, so that was, that was where I went to school, 16 months, which was really cool. And then I met Oliver Lieber actually, who was in town work, knew Paul, knows Paul and actually plays with Paul. Uh, in his band F Deluxe, which used to be the family, which is also Prince, you know, nothing compares to you era. So I met Oliver and I kind of asked him, I asked him how I could become like, you know, an engineer, what I should do next after I graduate. And he said, well, I couldn't really tell you what to do, but I could get you an internship at my brother's studio. So I was like, okay, great, let's do it. So I, um, I, told my parents and they're like, all right, you're going to LA, just go ahead and do it. Cause I, I didn't want to stay in Were Minnesota. You like 20? I was 19. 19. Yeah. So I, yeah, I went, cause I went to college right out of high school. So I, I just turned uh, 19 that summer and I was like, all right. So, so I moved out here. Yeah. When I was 19 with my brother and uh, he was kind of my chaperone, you know, cause they weren't going to let me just move out to Los Angeles as my, my own as a teenager. So that was fun. Um, and then I worked at Nightbird Recording Studios, which is in West Hollywood, underneath the Sunset Marquee, for a couple of years. And then I moved on, moved to the east side, and started interning at King Size. And then the guy who was running King Size, who's like, you know, session management, in-house engineer, Brian, went to work for Rob Schnoff next door. And then he asked me if I wanted to kind of take, fill in his role, which was like managing a team of interns and, and, Managing the studios, if you know Dave and Ron or if you know anything about King Size, you know that it is a multi-studio complex like throughout all the east side of Los Angeles. Now they have Gold Diggers in Santa Monica, which is past my time, but I've worked there and I love it there. It's a great studio. I went from Nightbird, which was very like assisting, uh, very like high profile uh, pop sessions, you know, movie star situation was really cool. It's King Size, which was awesome because it was less, you know, less hooking up eighth inch cables and getting the Xbox working and more actually like working on analog consoles, which was so fun. So that was great for me. And that's where I kind of like cut my chops tracking and getting like really getting sessions together and, and being able to do larger band tracking situations. So I would both engineer quite a bit and assist quite a bit there. Just, Fantastic. Yeah, just kind of the, I was the main contact. So I was like, oh, there's a session. Here's Eva, like take care of it. And I'd be like, here's all the mics, whatever, you know, like typical assistant. And then on top of that, it was also like making sure all this, you know, making sure all the right equipment was in the, there's so many studios. Like they had one up in North Hollywood for a bit. So it'd be like, send an intern up there. I'd go up there and set up, come down at the end of the night, close down Studio A. Like it was, it was a very, it was a lot, heavy, heavy lifting job, but really fun. And I met, so, I mean, half the people I know in LA, I feel like I met from that job uh, because so many people would come through there. So I met so many engineers and producers. So that was really cool. After that, I, you know, I worked there for a couple of years and then I just sort of, it, it was really fun, but it was getting to a point where I kind of maybe wanted a freelance because I did, I didn't really want all that responsibility anymore. It's a lot of responsibility and I love Dave and I love Rana, but I, I kind of just was like, you know, I kind of want to go and be doing sessions, just sessions and just engineering now at this point. So I kind of took a leap of faith and went freelance and um, 
So then for about a year, I was just doing little sessions here and there. And I actually was doing like singing. I worked for a website, which they would contract me to sing. So I was singing quite a bit for a year because I'm a singer songwriter as well. So that happened. Uh, that was kind of like my, my bag. And then I kind of was like, all right, well, then I started really thinking like, what do I really want to do? Like, do I want to like engineer bands or do I want to work for, you know, do I want to do, I, I worked for Howie Weinberg for like just a couple weeks, like going and maybe assisting him. I was like, mastering could be fun. It was at that point where I was like, okay, what's like my move? Like, and I, it was fine. Like I was still getting clients. I was still doing stuff. But at that point I didn't have a studio home base. I, w- I was still doing tracking and, um, so when my really good friend Forrest called me and asked me if I wanted to like help him out on Wonder Woman, uh, the, the film score, like he was going to mix it and or take over for Alan who was mixing it. And he was like, do you want to come assist me? You know, Pro Tools, right? And I was like, yeah, I know Pro Tools. Like, sure, I'll come. And and so I went uh, to remote control in Santa Monica. And then honestly, I've kind of had my foot there ever since. And still very much freelancing. I have a lot of different clients. I do stuff with podcasts and artists and obviously bands. Um, But now I've really kind of also veered into that like composer lane and working with composers. Um, My good friend, Jess Weiss is someone I've been working with quite a bit lately. She just uh, co-composed the new Cinderella with Michael Dana and I mix that for them and Afterlife of the Party, which is a cool Netflix film that just came out. And so I've done a few small Netflix films that have come out with, with a variety of composers in the, in the last couple of years. Like, especially during the pandemic is actually when I've kind of stepped out um, and started mixing more because I was working for Alan Marison for like two, two, three years as well. So Wonderful. Yeah, so I was at remote quite a bit and I was working with him and, and helping him on a variety of scores. Like, I mean, ton, Captain Marvel, Aquaman, Jumanji. I mean, I, I can't even, a lot, lot of movies. <laughs> We've done like tons of movies. Um, so that was that was really fun. And then I've ended up working with Hans on stuff as well. Like I've gone out on tour and been his playback engineer. So run Pro Tools and make sure that the rig goes up during the shows, stays up, stays up during the shows. Um, and uh, yeah, just miscellaneous sessions with him too, like tracking like vocals for like his scores and stuff uh, when he needs me. So that's like, and now I'm here. So I just built this home studio. Uh, wow. be- yeah, during the pandemic because... As much as I'm in all these beautiful studios, it, I, I didn't, at the end of the night, I didn't really have a place to go and park. Like if someone needed a mix change or I had a laptop, obviously, and like an interface, um, my Apollo twin, but it was kind of time, I think, to like kind of upgrade. So um, I just bought a new laptop, uh, one of the 2019 laptops during the pan, like before the pandemic. So I was like, this is going to be my souped up rig because those laptops are so great now. Um, but since then, Alan's lent me his Mac Mini. So I'm actually like running my system off that. And then I got the Apollo X8 kind of upgraded because I'm going to expand us around in this room fairly soon. So I can like just mix like smaller movies in here instead of having to go to like a bigger studio or whatnot. Pretty amazing. Incredibly balanced. I mean, you got to get in all kinds of different things from yeah. like managing and people to running sessions to assisting yeah. to sounds like a lot of understanding of clients as well, which is such a huge part of what we do. Right, right, right. Especially in like film and stuff. I can imagine you're dealing with, you know, people that like, you've got to deal with people's kind of expectations and stuff like that. I was talking to Madame, uh, well, her name is Kieran. Her stage name is Madame Gandhi. And I was talking to her about that because the thing about with film composers is that they answer to a higher power, right? Sure. They are answering to a director and the budgets are much larger and just the whole production of a film is 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 a lot. It's a lot more than just maybe an artist and a couple of producers in a studio making their record. And, and it's funny because it's true when you work with artists, it's like, you know, they're like, oh, the, you know, you could spend five hours on a lyric, right? It's like, oh, I don't know if this lyric is right. I, I, and, and it's very self-contained to their vision uh, where composers, they are trained uh classically and you know they're they're trained musicians they're trained to know how an entire orchestra works so it's funny because uh, i i i know a lot of composers so i'm not gonna i i can't really say. there are egos on certain composers absolutely i think we all have egos though i don't think we can you know uh although my favorite quote is drop your ego at the door which is something paul peterson taught me which i firmly believe anytime you walk into a studio you should but Uh, Yeah, composers, they're very smart. You know, they're intellectual and they're creative and they have to be. So, so funny. You can just tell them, 
like, hey, this this picture, this scene needs to be sad. And they can, they they know, they know how to play on emotions, which I think makes them a little bit neurotic themselves. But to have a professional job to play on emotions and know how to pull emotions out of people musically, which is like when I was young, I was fascinated with like a major versus a minor chord. Cause they were like, look, this is major. This is minor. It's happy and sad. And I was like, that is so crazy to me that you can relate to that. So, you know, going off on a tangent there. Uh, yeah. A lot of, I've worked with like a lot of different kinds of people in studios and worn a lot of different hats. And I'm obviously like a very outgoing, very talkative person, but like in sessions, I'm, uh, Depending on who I'm with, it's obviously not my job to be the biggest personality in the room, uh, especially if you're with like a big artist. And I learned that young. I was at a session at Oliver's house, actually, and Paula Abdul came in and Oliver kind of was like, just, you know, let her be at the front of the room. Like, th- let the artist be, let the artist be the artist and be the, like, it's their session. It's their, they're the ones typically paying for everything. So, like, let them kind of be the stars because that's what they are, basically, when you're in a studio, if you're just like the engineer or the producer. So tell us a little bit about your home setup. So you, th- this is recent. It's a pandemic setup. Yes, this is a new recent thing. It was when I moved in here, this room was just white walls. Um, none of this treatment was in here. It was just a white room. And I had like a little desk and I had little tiny speakers. And it was kind of, there was this old couch in here and everything. And I really thought about how I wanted it to be. And it was tough. I struggled actually pulling the trigger on it to get it moving because I didn't know what I wanted because I was a little skeptical of having a home studio in my house because I'm always in studios all the time. So like having a room in my house, also being a studio, I was a little like, it's got to be perfect. Like it has to be a vibe. It always has to be the right vibe because... I don't want to get sick of it. And I don't like I live here and it's a place I want to come. So finally, we kind of settled on this like speakeasy kind of steampunk, which it didn't end up like that. It might go more of that eventually, but I almost wanted it to be like kind of like whole old guy, like cigar office, kind of like powerful business. It's so (laughs) weird saying that. I don't know why I wanted it. It's probably because I wanted like the Chesterfield has that look. Yeah, like a power move. Well, we've got like the old record. You got a a drink cabinet over there. Yeah, we've got the I've got a whiskey cart and and so and maybe we'll get more decals. And I also wanted like to have little lanterns you hanging need a globe. out. You need like an old globe. The old globe. Yeah, I've got the old record player over there and that weird old monkey lamp. So I wanted it to be kind of like unique and a little darker. So now these days it's, which I do like the minimalistic thing. It's cool. It's like a lot of people, they've got white clouds, white walls, like maybe a colored couch. And that's that's it, which is cool. And like a couple lights. And I'm like, that is actually really... For me, it's nice. It's decluttered, and I have like I have pretty bad ADD. So yeah, walking into a space and not having anything. But then you go into certain studios, like Rob Rob Schnaff, for example. Studio's got chili pepper lights and like weird shit everywhere. Like little this, like every time I go there, he's got a plastic chicken that I always pick up and I and I honk it and I go, wow, it never gets old. It's always annoying. Um, <laughs> and it's been there now for like seven years. It's so funny. So. I, I was really, I was having a tough time and I decided like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And so that's why it's kind of this tweed fabric. The guy who built it, uh, his name is Andrew Monheim. He has Monheim mics and he does little, he does these like smaller little build outs for people. He did Alex's shed as well, the shed So he did all the wood in there. So Andrew built these for me, hung them for me, built this back thing and we worked it was, I mean, everything down to like the wood color, like is it we want rosewood or dark wood? And then, so the theme has been all this kind of various woods, which I think it works fine. Oh, it's, I like the tweet. It's, it's very Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted like this British kind of like yeah. weird thing. And uh, Kieran came in once. She goes, dude, this is like a dad studio. And I was like, what? It's a dad studio? You're going to go deer then, hunting later. Yeah, right. I know. So, <laughs> but... I really like it because everyone who comes in here gets a different interpretation of it. Sure. So some people call it a dad studio and some people call it a, some people are like, oh yeah, it's like a office or it's like a lounge or it's like a, we're in a bar or like something like that. I think the way you're describing is how it comes across. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like the build out here, as you can see, that's kind of what the build out looks like. And then I got the Apollo X8 um, because I kind of wanted to be able to expand a surround someday. Um, this is a standing desk, actually. It, uh, which is cool. I don't. It might be unplugged because I 
Oh, no, it's not. Oh, there you go. Nice. So if I want to stand, um, I can, because I sing, sometimes I'll like raise it up. I can raise it pretty high or raise it low, depending That's on. Great. If I'm great. Because I'll record myself sometimes playing guitar or singing. So I'll do that, um, which is cool. And then I got the S1 for mixing, which I totally love. Um, especially good for uh, like film stuff. Big thing with film mixing is that your job is basically to get it to sound as close to the ref, just sounding better, like their original mix, um, which is something I, I learned from, well, most com- film mixers will probably tell you that, like scoring mixers, but Alan was the one who kind of got that into my head. He refs religiously back and forth because the thing is with like score mixing is that you're not trying to make something new. Unlike this stuff, like with the Klezmer stuff, it's like, you know, the the sky is your limit, which is why it's tough to finish these mixes sometimes because you don't, like, is that reverb right? You guys like that reverb? And especially as a producer mixer, you have to make the call if that's what it's the sound is going to be. With that little fader port, it's really great because I can just A, B the ref for, like, scoring stuff and my mix really easily, which is great. So when I have clients in here, like, let me hear the mock-up, let me hear the ref so they can, my Jess especially will just kind of be hitting all the buttons and like going back and forth. So that's why I really love that thing. And also I can assign all my VCAs to it, uh, which is cool. Um, I have a Mac mini that I'm running, which I might upgrade soon just because that, that even that can't really handle big five, one surround sessions, um, which I want to expand to in here. And then as far as the speakers go, the Focals, as I told you, are a recent addition because of woofer on uh, the other ones I was using just, went out. So these I've, I, uh, you're, I really haven't used that much yet, but they just got put in. So I'll be using them tonight and tomorrow. And we'll see, because as I was telling you earlier off camera, I've been on this like speaker, you know, uh, sabbatical, trying all these different speakers, seeing what I like in here, which I mean, some people like laugh about, but I know so many professionals in this industry that work on so many different kinds of speakers that, I don't know. I'm just, I'm having trouble biting the bullet and just deciding on a pair that I want. It's just, it's tough, especially if we're going to go surround. I'm like, okay, now I also have to decide on a pair of smaller speakers that I would put in the back, which ideally people are like, your speaker should all be the same size. It should be the same kind of speaker, but I don't think I need like another set of focal, these focals behind me probably for surround. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically the gist of my home studio. Like the, as far as from everything from intention to just like, I want people to feel welcome. And that's also why I thought it was cool that it was kind of like a speakeasy. Like I like the office. It's kind of like closed doors. It's kind of like a private situation. So that's why I I wanted people to kind of like walk in and feel like they were somewhere else and not feel like they were in a normal studio or, you know, most studios you walk in, you're like, wow, this is a studio studio. Um, Like they're so, sometimes they're so clean or sometimes they're the opposite. So I wanted to kind of find like a even balance of people. No, it was lovely. We came in through the front door. You've got a, you've got a lounge in there. Yeah. And you walk in and you're like, wow, this is a really cool space. Yeah, it's it's great. So I'm Well, you're talking about guitars. You're also talking about being a singer songwriter. So you kind of Threw yourself in the deep end there. I see you have a seagull. Yeah, yeah. That is a, I got, when did I get that guitar? I got that guitar like, I don't know, seven years ago. Yeah. Great. It's probably going to be out of tune. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is, when did we get this? Every time I go home for Christmas, I like, uh, I end up singing at church. So I, uh, it was really funny. I went home one year and they're like, you never have a guitar when you come home. Let's just get you an acoustic. Um, so I was like, all right, cool. This would be, so my dad actually, we got, my dad got this guitar for me as like a present, um, a really beautiful like little guitar shop in the in our in our town, like a small little uh, shop. So I have a really cute picture of him playing it. Yeah, so. Lovely. Yeah, we've got guitars and, um, you know, my roommate, it, th- those, most of those guitars are not mine. Uh, actually, none of those other guitars are mine. A lot of them are Alex's. So because Alex has a plethora of instruments, including a Mellotron, Mellotrons and Nords and Moogs and Prophets, it's really great because we, like my, the artists I work with, 
oftentimes we'll we'll like put up some of the keyboards in here and play them or I can yeah. plug in like bass so if I have a bass player in here they can come in and like just plug in the bass and play and then it's great that Alex has a B3 in his studio because we've actually ended up laying down we've laid down organ on like more than more tracks than than I'd be willing to admit like most records that I'm working on right now have Alex's organ playing on it because <laughs> they were just like you know what we need what in organ all right well let me call Alex and then we'll just bring the session out there and he'll like play a bunch, like a bunch of stuff on it. And some songs, it's like become the saving grace of it. So it's really cool to like be living with him. Hammond can like do one of multiple things. But one of the great things is, is you can add sort of thickness, can't you? If you just yeah. Wanna... Well, and and so like a lot of a, a lot of things together. I think. Well, yeah, and like with this klezmer music that we're doing, like a lot of it is like a lot. They play a lot of things 2D. So there's a lot of solo like. A lot of sections that the whole band is playing. And sometimes it's like, bah, da, 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 da. like it's like these kind of like sharper, you know, more staccato solos or soli sections. So having him play organ is that, yeah, sometimes it's like, sometimes we're just like, we just need one thing that's not playing that. And so we go, organ, like we need the organ on it um, because everybody's playing one thing. And then so he'll just like lay a scream in organ like note down high or low. And then we're like, that's exactly what we needed. Exactly. Like it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So it's cool. And then with Karen also like with Madame Gandhi, it's the same. There's a couple tracks that she's a, she's a drummer and, and percussionist. So a lot of her tracks are very, she'll produce them as far as she can go. And then lately I'll help her and arrange, help her with her arrangements and move stuff around. And she'll tell me to move it around. And then uh, we had Alex play on some stuff way back when, before the arrangements were done. And so we just pulled in some of his organ parts. And she's like, oh my God, this has made it. It fills it out because her stuff is very percussive and very like, you know, wants to get like a more like kind of staccato bits and pieces because she kind of thinks that way because she's very rhythmic. So then having that organ lay down actually really helps some of her songs, some of her pieces. I was listening to some of the stuff because you posted some things on Instagram. So okay. I went and searched it out. Yeah. Whose stuff? Madame Gandhi's, because you were, you posted some stuff of you, I think you were, some photos of you working together yeah, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been working at Gold Diggers recently, yeah. and she'll come over and work here. Uh, she just moved up to Stanford, but I was working with her. She lived up in Topanga. Nice. So we go up there, but yeah, we've recorded like congas and uh, bongos at Gold Diggers. And Has Piper mastered her stuff? Yes, Piper has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it yeah, all yeah, sort yeah. of comes together now. Yeah, yes. I remember Piper talking. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I think Piper, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to mix this stuff for her. We've talked about maybe I'll do the Atmos mixes, maybe. Um, but I think Piper Piper will probably be mastering this project as well. Fantastic. So it's awesome. Yeah, it's super collab because yeah. me and Piper are really great friends. And now, yeah, me and Kieran have grown to be really close throughout the process. So it's it's been really fun. I love the ceiling as well. Isn't it fun? We might pin them up. We don't know yet, but we, we, uh, I, I like to. Ni so Niles Godfather mm -hmm. is a guy named John Featherstone. Uh, also a British, a uh, British fellow, uh, lives in Arizona and has a very large lighting company. Like goes on, his daughter also is in it. Like they go on, she goes on tour with Lady Gaga. He, he does giant shows. He flies all around the world doing like big, Incredible. big shows. So he's, he's great. So I, I, we were cracking up. I sh had showed pictures and he kind of was like, let me know if you need lighting. And I was like, I need lighting. So he sent me all this stuff. He's so sweet. He sent me all this stuff. Um, uh, through email, just send me all these fixtures that I might want. So I got this one. I actually got, there's a cute, like the little circle, the little gold, like vintage circle bulbs in the living room. I also put in there and then he got me those up lights. So I've got like an up light there an up light behind the guitar. So at night, the room is really vibey. Like it's just got a this lot of This is one of the light. first things I noticed when I walked in. I was like, wow, that is an unusual chandelier. Isn't it weird? <laughs> it's super weird. A yeah. chandelier lamp. I don't know. It's a octo it's a yeah it's yeah. some sort of uh weird octopus type uh yeah. yeah it's it's uh yeah it's really weird that's why i like it <laughs> yeah it's absolutely fantastic yeah so john yeah i met him on tour uh with uh hans he was doing these sh these shows for these uh lights for the show that we did in salt lake city so i met him and he was the did you do the guy. full tour with hans and everything 
Well, he's done, um, I mean, he's done quite a few, so. Did you, did you do the full tour when he did like uh, Lollapalooza and all that stuff? I did not do that when he did Coachella. Coachella, so did yeah, you say so Lollapalooza? I, no, yeah, I wasn't Coachella. on Coachella. The first the first shows I was on was in 2017. I actually went as a woodwind tech because I play woodwinds. Um, play woodwinds as well? Oh, he travels with like a 15 person band. No, you play woodwinds. Oh, I play woodwinds, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I play saxophone. Wow. Yeah. So I've been playing sax. I started when I was like in middle school and played throughout college. And so I was jazz, like uh, alto and baritone saxophone. So I, uh, so I was a woodwind tech for the woodwind player, Pedro, who's one of the most, he is probably one of the best woodwind players on the planet. And so I did that. And then the next tour, which was two, two years ago, three, well, three, now I guess 2019, I did play back. And that was just an Asia, Australia run. It sounds like in 10 years, you've accomplished what most people do in many, many more years. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess so. Uh, yeah, it depends. I just, I like, I I don't want to say I get bored easily, but I like a challenge. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I, I like to do a lot of different things. Some people say you can't, and I do agree. I think that, and I have kind of veered more towards like mixing, especially like score mixing. I really like score mixing. Uh, it's really fun. I've always... Loved film music, uh, especially Hans's music. I was a fan of, you know, even when I was a kid. It's hard not to be. I mean, he pretty much did fifty yeah. percent of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I know. So I love orchestra. I love. I love that music. I love emotional music. So I love that kind of stuff. I really do, and I love working with composers. So that is something that, like, in the last couple of years, I have realized that I do want to focus more on that. But in saying that. I don't think you can ever lose like your tech side, especially with this stuff. Because if you don't have a tech or you don't, you know, don't have an assistant, you're like kind of dead in the water sometimes with some of this stuff. So it's, I, that's why I do like doing stuff like that. Like I'll go on tour and I'll go tech, you know, be a tech or I'll go um, like even doing live playback because you learn, you learn so much stuff all the time. Like you're, you're always learning, um, which I love to do, which you have to do in this industry anyway. Even going from like pop to going to analog king size and then going to the film scoring was another whole like, oh my gosh, wow. And so I feel like now I've had so much of that experience under my belt. It's been easier to go out on my own and easier to engineer and freelance mix and stuff. Cause not only have I so much experience working with so many people, I also have been able to watch some of the best people in the world do it. Like Alan, for instance, and some of these, you know, some of the best composers in the world and all this stuff. So that's given me. I interviewed Alan last year for AES and he had built his own home studio. Yes, he's got a great studio at home. It's really cool. Yeah, I've been over there. Uh, I've been over there a couple times uh, to bring him stuff and and whatnot. So yeah, he's got a great little ATC room in his house, and his I mean his mixes coming out of there sound incredible. So he'll now he's done some stuff at remote because he's still got his room there, and then he'll he does a lot of his stuff at home. It's just easy. Stay at home. Yeah. With COVID, it's like just why risk it? So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. How long have you been in this place? Well, I moved in here last July. So not long, a little over a year now. It's interesting. So it feels very welcoming. I thought maybe you'd been here a long time. I did quite a bit to make it, like this, this, the living room used to look a lot different. I We rearranged the entire living room. Um, there was just a lot of random stuff in there. So I've cleared out a lot of the stuff and then obviously the paint helps and the different light fixtures and all of that. So yeah, we... we we try to do that because we have musicians over quite a bit and we have clients over. So it's like people like you, we have people like my my friend uh, Jess, like a lot of people like Michael Dana walked through the door the other night, you know, and I was like, oh, good, cool. Glad it's clean in here, you know. So we've been we've been working on making it like welcoming, but also pretty professional, but also a place that's like our house. So we feel comfortable, like have we have barbecues, tons of friends over with barbecues and, you know, little parties and everything and like movie nights and stuff like that. So that's- and it's, a, it's a wonderful little neighborhood because it's yeah. it's really close to busyness, but yeah. you get like half a block in and it's suddenly quiet. it all goes really quiet. Yeah, no, it's really, it's a, it's a pretty quiet street. Thank you ever so much. Thanks for coming. I'm honored, honored to be on the show. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy to have you. Honored to be considered a pro, honestly. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're not a pro, then none of us are. Oh, well, thank you, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Please leave any comments and questions below. Thank you again, Eva. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Have a marvelous time.